Let's do some practice questions from the British Physics Olympiad. These are questions from the 2017 GCAC Intermediate Challenge and you should check out the website of the British Physics Olympiad for more details. Also, just a little note that uh, these are not official solutions, these are just my solutions for the questions and you should definitely check out the official mark scheme. I'll provide a link in the description. Okay, well, let's get started with some practice. Question one, the mass of several different material samples recorded, uh, the mass is plotted against the density. So on the y-axis we have density, on the x-axis we have mass. Which two samples have the same volume? Well, we're going to use the equation that density is um, equal to mass over volume. This of course means that the volume will be equal to the mass divided by the density. So for each of those points all we need to do is take the mass divided by the density, take the mass divided by the density and work it out. Okay so for the first point the mass is going to be 100 grams and then we're going to be dividing that by I think it's five. Let's just get rid of this temporarily. Um, the density is 5 grams per centimeters. So this means that the volume for this will be 100, which is the mass, divided by the density, which is 5, which is going to give me a volume of 20 cubic centimeters. So for the next point, we're going to have a mass of 200 grams and the volume is still the same, which is 5. So it's going to be 200 divided by 5, uh, which is going to be uh, just 40 cubic centimeters. So 1 and 2 is not the answer. Uh, 3, 3 will be 300 divided by 10. So that's easy. That's just 30. Now 4 is going to be 300 divided by 15 and uh, that is of course just 20. Now we can see that point 1 and point 4 have the same volume in cubic centimeters so the answer has to be 1 and 4. Um, this corresponds to answer D. Okay, in a particle accelerator such as those at CERN, uh, particle energies are measured in giga electron volts. Giga is a unit prefix meaning 10 to the 9 and what we need to do is convert the energy from 920 giga electron volts to joules. Okay, well 920 giga electron volts, giga means times 10 to the power of 9 and the electron volt means a multiplication factor of 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19. Uh, okay, well, let's put this into a calculator. So 920 times 10 to the 9 times 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19. And what we're going to get is 1.472 times 10 to the power of minus 7 joules. And let's see what answer that corresponds to. Correct answer will be C. Okay, question three. Two gas cylinders have the same volume. Each cylinder contains one mole of gas at 20 degrees Celsius. One cylinder contains hydrogen and the other one contains oxygen. What can be determined about the pressure in each gas cylinder and the speed of the gas molecules in each cylinder? Now, let's read the options carefully and decide what the correct answer is. I would say that the best way to tackle this question actually is to think about which one of those gases is lighter. Well the hydrogen gas is as light as it gets because it only has one proton and then one electron orbiting it. Oxygen is going to have a lot more of those protons, meaning that it's going to have a lot more mass and the nucleus is just a lot heavier. Well, because of that, the speed of the hydrogen will be considerably greater. There's only one answer which uh, involves the speed of the hydrogen being greater, and this is answer B. Uh, the 
the relative pressure of the two gases will be the same. There is a formula actually that uh, maybe you'll do at A level, that is that PV is equal to nRT, where uh, n is the number of moles, R is just a constant, and T is the temperature. So at the same volume, the pressure will just be nRT over the volume, meaning the pressure will be the same if all of those things on the right hand side are the same. Therefore, the correct answer is B. Okay, next one. So questions four and five refer to the following velocity time graph. So the graph shows how the velocity of a car changes over a period of 10 seconds. The car is traveling along a straight road. The maximum acceleration of the car is approximately equal to what? Well, the maximum acceleration will occur at the steepest portion of the graph. So what we really need to do is draw a tangent at the steepest part. So if you're going down this by bike, if you're going up uh, this by, by bike, the steepest part will be along here. Now this, will, this is very difficult to draw without a digital ruler, but I'll just try and do my best. In the real exam, please use a real ruler. And the velocity will just be the gradient of the tangent. It will be the gradient of um, of this line. So the gradient will be approximately, well in this region it's going from here from 0 to around 20 uh, so the um, our change in the y-axis gradient is delta y over delta x delta y will be around 20 meters per second and over what time frame does that actually happen? Well, each one of those intervals is two and a half seconds because there's four of them and 10 divided by four is two and a half. So this is more or less equal to, it's approximately equal to, let's say that this is approximately equal to uh, two time intervals, which is five seconds. So this is somewhere around, uh, the acceleration will be somewhere around four meters per second squared. Closest answer to this is D 3.6. Okay, now the distance traveled by the car in 10 seconds is approximately what? Well, the rule that we're going to use is that the distance traveled is the area underneath the curve. We can no longer use the fact that distance is just speed times time uh, because the speed varies. This is only true for constant velocity. So anytime we have a curve like this, what we really need to be doing is estimating the area underneath it if it's not a uh, straight line. So uh, the best way to estimate this is with a triangle. And this will almost be a perfect approximation because we can imagine this thing to be a triangle. Once again, my hand is not super steady, but you can just sort of imagine this to be a triangle like that. And um, what is the area of this triangle? Well, um, it's going to be a half times the base times the height, which is going to be a half times two times 20 multiplied by 10, which is going to be 10 times 10, which is going to be around 100 meters. Correct answer is B. Okay, question six. In the circuit shown, the resistance of the thermistor decreases. So this guy's resistance goes down. How does the reading on the ammeter and the voltmeter change when the temperature increases? Um, Okay, so we know that the resistance of the thermistor decreases. This means that the total resistance in the circuit will uh, decrease, and if the resistance is going down, this means that the current has to go up. Now, if the current goes up, this here is actually a fixed resistor, and because of that, the voltage of the fixed resistor, that's equal to I times R. R cannot change, but the current has increased, and if the current has increased, therefore this voltage has increased. Um, if this voltage increases, then this one here has no other option but 
to decrease. Why is that? Because they have to add up to the EMF of the cell. Imagine that this one here was six volts. This one here was, I don't know, three volts. And this one here was three volts. If this one here suddenly goes up to four volts, this one here has to go down to two volts because they need to add up to six. It's the same principle. Therefore, the voltage across the thermistor will have to go down. So voltmeter reading decreases, the current increases. Correct answer has got to be D. Okay, question seven. A light ray travels from glass to air as shown. The refractive index of air is just one. The refractive index of the glass could be what? Now, this is actually a really interesting question. So the angle of refraction is just this angle here. It's always the angle to the normal. Now, if this angle here is 40 degrees, then this angle here will also be around 40 degrees, but it's a little bit bigger than 40 degrees. So um, I'm going to say that at the very most, looking from the diagram, this angle could not be more than sort of 70 maximum. Um, we're kind of estimating in this question, more likely somewhere between 60 and 65. And uh, maybe we could even try and measure it with a protractor if, uh, if we had that. Uh, how can we estimate the angle of refraction? Well, there is an equation called Snell's law. Let me just introduce that. N1, when this is the first refractive index, times the first angle of refraction, sine theta 1, is equal to N2 sine theta 2. And it's another sort of A-level physics equation, but it's pretty simple. N1 sine theta 1 is equal to N2 sine theta 2. Now, if we assume that the first angle is 40 as it's given, and the second angle is sort of 60 or 70, let's just call it 65 maybe, um, then um, N1 will be N2 sine theta 2 over sine theta 1, uh, which will then be equal to, now N2 is the refractive index of air, which is just 1, so it's just going to be 1 times sine of, let's look at the maximum possible case, which is 70 divided by uh, the initial one, which is 40 degrees. Now, if we put this into a calculator, we're going to get around 1.46 as a absolute maximum, but as a good estimate, closest value is going to be D, 1.4. Okay, next one, a student measures the potential difference across a fixed value resistor, okay, and also measures the current through the resistor. A graph of the potential difference and current produces a straight line as shown. The graph shows which of the following. Current is directly proportional to potential difference. Well, if that was to happen, it would have to go straight through the origin. The voltmeter was consistently reading more than it should to. Um, well, if that's the case, the graph will be displaced the other way. However, if the ammeter was consistently reading more than it should do, and every reading was displaced by the same amount, then the graph will get shifted upwards because each point, rather than being here, is here. And the next point, rather than being here, is here. And the next point, rather than being here, is here. And this is known as a systematic error. Every reading is shifted upwards by the same amount, uh, meaning that the correct answer uh, has got to be C. Okay, next one. Iodine has several radioactive isotopes. A sample of an iodine compound contains a radioactive isotope that can be used as a tracer in medical physics. The half line of the iodine isotope is affected by, um, well, the temperature of the sample, the chemical composition, the quantity present in the sample, the time sample is prepared, none of the above. Uh, it's an intrinsic quantum mechanical property that is not affected. We cannot um, make it decay quicker or slower. Okay, next one. 
A roller coaster includes a circular loop the loop. The roller coaster carriage enters the bottom of the loop at 25 meters per second. The loop has a diameter of 30 meters. The carriage is freewheeling along the track, meaning that it's not being driven by a motor. The speed of the carriage at the top of the loop is approximately what? Okay, so this is a question about conservation of energy. The initial kinetic energy, which is going to be a half times the mass times the initial speed squared, will be equal to the total energy at the top of the loop. Now, at the top of the loop, there's going to be two types of energy. There's going to be some amount of kinetic energy, let's call that K2, but there's also going to be some potential energy, which is MgH. So this here will be equal to MgH plus a half times the mass times the final speed squared. Um, okay, well, some students will be thinking, okay, I need to work out the mass, somehow not solve this, but if we look carefully, we can actually just cancel it out, and then we can directly substitute and find the final speed. So uh, let's do this. We can say that a half v2 squared, do not forget the squared, will be a half v1 squared, take away gh. Now I'm going to multiply everything by 2, meaning that v2 squared will be uh, given by v1 squared, take away 2gh. Now I'm going to square root everything, so v2 will be the square root of v1 squared minus 2gh. Now this here is the square root of 25 squared, do not forget the square, take away 2, let's take g to be 10 meters per second per second, multiply by the height, which was just 30. If we put this into a calculator, we are going to get 5 meters per second. Correct answer is C. Okay guys, so we have solved the multiple choice questions from the 2017 Olympiad and we absolutely need to do a little bit more practice on the longest style questions on the British Physics Olympiad as well in order to get the best possible result and this video is right over here. Enjoy!